many centers are around the country? Do you know how many NASA centers there are? There are 10. There are 10. <laughs> there are 10. And so um, all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them have a visitor center. And so they're actually, every single one is run differently. And so our visitor center is free to the public, and we're open six days a week. The only day we're not open is on Mondays, and that's just our maintenance day. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is um, corporate, uh, thank God for the Obama administration, because without Obama, Obama has a huge focus on STEM education, which means that he put a lot of money together so that um, places like this place can be updated. And so part of what that I was going to was this exhibit here. That also gave me a job. But part of that is this exhibit right here. And so this exhibit was recently updated. And what's it come inside? Yeah. We tried to make it fancier. And so you are now standing inside of a life-size model of the Destiny module on the International Space Station. And so this is the actual size, and so the Destiny module is the American portion of the laboratory. And so there are 10 countries involved in the International Space Station, and NASA, of course, is one of those 10, the U.S. is one of those 10 countries. And so this is a life-size model of the International Space Station. And I just want to introduce it by introducing this actual structure. And so this wasn't originally built to be an exhibit. This was built to actually this side, it's got two sides, so this side right here, you can see the racks here were actually designed as a sort of, um, uh, as a sort of show and tell. So when they wanted to build a space laboratory, they built this to show what we could do, what we could do in a space laboratory. Now on this side is actually actual racks that you would find on the International Space Station. And this was built so that you could size your equipment before it went into space. Because, I mean, how embarrassing would it be if you built something like a glove box, got it up to space, and realized that you had miscalculated by a half inch? That would be really embarrassing. That would be a very expensive mistake. And so what we've done with this is we've actually taken it and we tried to make it as hands-on as we could. And so I'll, you guys actually will get to touch real space equipment, and I'm going to show you what that is in, very, in just a quick moment. But um, first, the other thing I want to point out is let's look up at the ceiling and at the floor. Now, if you were inside of the International Space Station, all of the space would be used. Now, the other thing that's interesting about all space laboratories is the fact that they all have an up and down. And so when you are here, you'll see that even though we have these fun little red lights on the floor here, we have these working lights along the top, along the ceiling. And so the reason why they do this is actually for astronauts, for their, psych for their mental health. Because if you had everything sort of kind of mishmashed every which way, it might get a little sort of disorienting for the astronauts. And so you would have storage in the ceiling and in the floor, and then along the walls is where you would have your actual experiments. And so we're going to start actually right here. So I'm sorry, I'm going to come back over here. So we're going to start right here. And you want to be my volunteer? All right. So this is actually just a little digital interactive. And one of my favorite things is the 360 tour. So let's just, okay, pick a module. Which module do you want to go to? You want to go to the I don't care module? That's my favorite. <laughs> so this is the Destiny module. And so you're inside a life-size model, and then this is an image of what it actually is. And so you can see everything is actually pretty, pretty contained within the walls. And so this is a real image. And so we have this 360 tour, and the best thing about this is that this is actually online. So if you Google International Space Station and Interactive Guide, you will get to this. It's a flash online, and so if you're in your classroom, um, you can go and you can have your students interact with this. Or you can do it at home. I mean, I do too. I think it's fun, so I like to play with it too. So we have an example of it here, but you can actually do it at home too. Um, we also have right here, so this is some, these are some vats here, so these are some uh, real equipment that we kind of turned into these little sort of displays here. And so this is a, a little model of the shuttle, and then down here we have a model, what do you think that is? That, it is not the International Space Station, but the other famous one that came before it, do you know what that was called? It's Mirror Skylab. It is Mirror. 
atmosphere. And Skylab, actually another famous space laboratory, actually fit inside the, sh the shuttle payload bay. That was Skylab. Um, and then NASA actually tried to build their own orbiting space station, but unfortunately we were not very good at it, and we couldn't keep it in orbit, so it actually re-entered. And so that's when we decided to partner up with Russia, because they've had a lot of experience building floating space station orbiting, orbiting laboratories, and so we partnered with them, and then other countries joined in, and now there are 10 countries involved in the International Space Station. So here, astronauts need to eat, and so this is actually some real astronaut food that you see here, and this is actually the facility that you would use to rehydrate your food. So food is heavy, and there are no grocery stores in outer space. There's no safe way, I know. Who would have thought? Anyway, so what you would do is you, and we have to bring everything up there, and it's a lot easier to bring dehydrated food and some water than it is to bring a lot of heavy, hydrated food. And so what you would do is you would take your delicious-looking macaroni and cheese. I know, it looks delicious. You would plug it into this little spout right here, fill it with the appropriate amount of water, shake it up, let it sit for a couple of minutes, then you would actually cut the package open and eat it. With a fork and so you don't actually it's not they don't eat everything out of straws however if you do have your drink like this green tea that we have here you fill it with your hot water you shake it up let it sit you put a straw in it they actually have a a very special tool because if you started drinking your green tea and then you decided that you didn't want to drink or you decided that you wanted to breathe or something um, you would, if you took it out of your mouth, it would continue, because because you've created a suction force inside of the package, it would continue to flow out. And so they have a very special clip, probably one of their most important tools, a very special clip that, that sits on the edge of the straw. And so, that's, that's a little bit about astronaut food. And then here we actually have an astronaut exercise station. And so you can see there's a lot of information there in the video about exercising, and this is actually the best part right here because they're talking about how when you're in outer space, you know, if you think about it, if you're not using your muscles, you lose muscle tissue. You also lose bone density. You lose mus muscle tissue. So astronauts actually have to work out around two hours a day. And a regular residency in the International Space Station is about six months. And so there are two types of exercise. There's cardio, so this is just a little hand bike, so a cardio, and there's also, unfortunately, it's um, it's in repair right now, but there's, it's resistance training, because if you lift weights, you're not really doing anything, and so we, they have resistance training, and so they actually have some very fancy equipment that's uh, multi-purpose for multi-exercises. Um, they also actually have a very specific nutritional plan. And the reason why, and each astronaut gets their own nutritional plan, because we're all different, and our bodies are all different, and so it needs to be personalized. Here, we have a robotic arm, and the reason why we have a robotic arm here is because Canada built the robotic arm for the International Space Station. And the, the reason why a robotic arm is incredibly important, because it's a lot easier to install a new module with a robotic arm than it is to actually get five astronauts to go out in their spacesuits and do dangerous extravehicular activity to install a module, and it's a lot easier, especially since the robot arm can lift anything because it's all weightless. Now, here's one of my favorite questions. We, when you're inside of the International Space Station and you're doing experiments, you're doing them in microgravity, not in zero gravity. Now, why is it microgravity? Why do you think? ISS has its own gravity. That's right. The ISS has its own gravity. And in fact, it's only simulated microgravity. Why is that? That I know. That one's a little bit tougher. It's because it's in, they're in constant free fall. So it's basically as if they fell and then missed the edge of the Earth. And so are continually falling around the Earth. It's continuous free fall. That's why you feel weightless. Here, in weightlessness... It's important, actually, to keep your, if you're using small items, it's important to keep them contained because things will literally end up any, everywhere, including your nose and eyes. And so when they're working with experiments, they'll work inside something like this, like a glove box. And so we have a glove box here where you can kind of try to see how easy or how difficult it is to work inside of this contained space. One of my favorites is there's a target on the top. Let's see if I can get it up there. Yes! Here, 
actually is an opportunity for you to get involved in the International Space Station. You can watch it fly over your house. And so I have a little video here of the ISS flying over the East Coast at night. But you can actually go out and observe, and there's a Java applet online, which is with this QR code, there's a Java applet online where you can go and track the International Space Station and wait for it to fly over your house. So that's pretty cool. And I just like watching it fly up the East Coast. Look at the lights, all that light pollution. Anyway, moving on. Over here, actually here are the ends, we just have a great video that's called the Destination Station, the first 10 years, the last 10 years. So the International Space Station was now just completed. It took 10 years to build it. So the past 10 years missions have been focused on building the International Space Station. Now that it's complete, we're going to start working on the science, doing research. I mean, they've been doing research the whole time, but now our focus is going to switch from building to actually experimenting. And so there's actually a call out, and even students, um, elementary school students, can submit projects that could to fly in space. So actually, I heard of one group of students that submitted a project. They wanted to test different types of paint. So they got a board and they painted on it with different types of paint and it went up into space. And they tested it in the extreme environment of space. They put it outside the station. So it's pretty cool. So here we, over here we actually have a, bio, a biomass production system. And so what do you do in a biomass production system? You grow plants. And so down here on the floor I actually have a video of plants growing in space. And one of the most interesting things about plants in space is that if you have a light source, they will grow towards it. But, it, but their root systems kind of grow all well, sort of haphazardly, like kind of whatever, because the root system is what's affected by gravity. So the roots feel gravity and so they grow downward, or, or outwards trying to stabilize the plant. However, light is what the actual greenery is growing towards. So it's kind of interesting how that stuff works. So I just have a little loop. So this is actually a microgravity. Those are growing in space. So, this is, a, again, this is an actual piece of equipment that you would find in on any kind of space laboratory. Here, here I'm going to stand away from it and just point at it. So over here we actually have some real astronaut equipment. So this is from a, a few older missions, but this is real actual equipment. And you can see one of the most frequently used pieces of material in astronaut equipment is Velcro. Now the two most important tools, as I understand, in, on, in space are Velcro and duct tape. And so Velcro is actually used to stabilize, really, even yourself to the International Space Station. Uh, even your clothing is covered in Velcro. And here we have a video of one of my most favorite astronauts, Scott Kelly. He's talking, he's inside of his bedroom, and he's talking about how he handles his, how, what he does with his personal life on the International Space Station. He's actually leaning up against his sleeping bag. And so <clears throat> astronauts sleep on the walls, or on the floor, or on the ceiling, or however you want to orient it. And um, everything is, is really useful with Velcro. And so what you have in here, this is just a Velcro sheet, this blue thing here. And so you could hook up your materials to it. And so you can see those little vials are actually food for a honeybee experiment that was done. Um, these ones here are these BPS disc kits, since this is the sort of VIP back behind the scenes tour. I will admit to you that they are full of floppy disks. I know it's a little yes. old. It's a little old, but yeah, those are those are floppy disk kits. <coughs> Excuse me. That right there, this thing that's hanging out down here, it looks kind of like a strange fanny pack. That is actually a laptop shelf, so you can put your laptop on your person. You would hold it right here. And then this thing is NASA's version of a fanny pack, and so you would put things inside of the netting there and then close it. So that's that's all the stuff that we have here. And also just a pouch, foil pouch. Um, that's this book in the back is a toolkit, so you can put your tools in there, that kind of stuff. So here, actually somebody has already given it a try. So here what we have is um, this is actually a habitat rack, and so one of the things about working in space is trying to have as many experiments in a small space as you can, and so this is actually designed 
each one of these drawers would be a different experiment. And so each drawer would have its own controls. And so you can have like, you know, this drawer is only full of nitrogen, this drawer is full of oxygen, you know, whatever you want it to be. And each drawer is individual. And so what we have is we actually have many different experiments, which these are, I know, very high-tech experiments that we have here. And so we have a little hands-on activity where you could, you want to try to fit as many experiments as you can into your confined space like the ISS. And, but you just have to remember that astronauts have to be able to access, so if there are experiments behind other experiments, the astronauts can't really get to them. So that's what we have here, just look, you know, an easy little hands-on experiment. These are actually the locks, so I'll relock it. Because everything is built to be modular. actually a frog experiment. So basically what they did is they had a bunch of fertilized frog eggs. Actually, you know what, I believe that they fertilized them in space. And so they were interested to see if the frogs would develop normally. And so they had the control section, which is here. And so if I push this, this is a centrifuge. And so it spins with the frog, the frog vials inside. And that would stimulate 1G, which is what? Earth gravity. Very good. Earth gravity. So 1G is Earth gravity. Then these guys would be in 0G. So you would have your little frog vials in here in 0 gravity. And then what, and what they actually discovered is that the frogs developed normally. However, the 0G frogs didn't know how to swim. They would swim in circles. Rather than in any particular direction, they would swim in circles. I'm going to just stick this back in here. The adult frogs would live inside of this green thing that's actually stuck. I can't, I can't take it out. It got stuck recently. Sorry. But, um, so this flew many, a few, quite a few years ago. You can tell in the video they have some, some footage of the astronauts. You can tell by their beautiful polos and their lovely hairstyles. Uh, just what time period you're dealing with. They're a bit dated. And then finally, the last rack that I want to talk about is this one right here. And so this rack is actually just another representation of how modular everything is built to be. And so you can see all of the different components inside, but also this thing right here, which is another glove box, that all of the glove box boxes are actually built to be modular. And so I would be able to take this out. I can put it over there if I needed it over there. I don't want people to actually do that so because it snaps when you try to put it back in. But it's in, again, VIP tour. So this is, again, another piece of actual equipment. So this is, I'm not sure if this one flew or not, but if it didn't, then this was a backup system for one that flew. So this is an actual system. And so, you know, it's got all of the fun inputs. Everything is always, actually, you know, it's funny here on this one, all of the locks are these spring-loaded locks that you have to twist so it doesn't open. And they're confusing. They're really quite confusing. So, that is pretty much a quick little sort of crash tour of this new exhibit. So this exhibit just opened just last week. It opens, yeah. Good job. Thank you. Been <laughs> working very hard on it, and so um, yeah. Well, you know, it, this 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 structure has always been here, but we just opened this update just last week. So, and they're going to come back in and do a couple of other things. There's still a couple of things left to do, but it it opened, and I'm I am thrilled because now I don't have to be here working on it. But anyway, <laughs> so let, let's move on. I want to show you some other stuff. So those are just spare parts that are from around the country. Yeah, you know, so um, believe, uh, there's a lot of stuff that NASA has, and so a lot of it was just asking the right people if right. they wanted to donate some stuff. And as the, a lot of it was applying, too. But you know what? I mean, even NASA, when the shuttle program was, um, it's actually still in the process of being dismantled, but a lot of the materials from the shuttle program are being donated to institutions and schools. 
And so in the shuttles, as you know, they were donated. People didn't buy them. They were donated to different facilities. The, on the back end, the facility had to pay for the packing and the shipping, and they also had to demonstrate that they had a proper facility to store it, which cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the shuttles were given to them. And so more shuttle stuff that I have is this is a, these are actual engine parts from shuttle. So this is a part that flew. A lot of these things that you see here actually flew. This is, let me, let me take a look. This is the main engine O2 turbo pump rudder shaft. I don't know exactly what it does. My apologies, but it is part of the engine. And actually, here's, here's a model of the engine. So you can see all of the intricate parts. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an O2 turbine for the engine. And so I believe this, if I can point it out, <coughs> I found it once. Okay. I think this is actually inside of one of these little um, cylinders that are towards the top there. So just to give you a bit of perspective about size, that I think is inside of one of those cylinders. Mm. Oh, wow. The small cylinder. Yeah. The so small cylinders at the top. So we have a lot. This is an actual astronaut seat. This one flew too. This flew on the Endeavor, which is one of the first shuttles that we built. It looks, you know, honestly, when we got it and we opened it, like I think it's actually not quite right. It's, I think it's just a little too um, lean forward. I think you would actually. I don't want to mess with it too much, but you, it's actually like this, where you're, they're almost leaning forward, but if you think about it, they're lying on it, right? You know, when they're sitting on the launch pad, they're lying on it. And so the equipment has to be incredibly stable to actually hold them upright, you know, so they're not, because they're already feeling 3G's worth of force. How much does 3G's feel like, do you know? Could you, can you figure out how much, if 1G is Earth gravity, what would 2G's be? Right. Yeah, exactly. 3G is three times what we feel now. So really, if you think about it, it's like cloning yourself twice and then putting them both on your chest. That's what it feels like. So actually, astronauts say most people pass out at 3Gs. And I, as I understand, about 20Gs, your heart can't handle 20G pressure because it's just too much pressure. Yeah. Over here, we actually have some light plane shuttle tiles. I like to show them just because of the difference in thickness. So the white tiles are just the regular tiles, and then the black tiles are actually the re-entry tiles. And so you can see that they're different. And um, the black tiles were actually developed here at Ames, partially developed here at Ames. We have an arc jet facility, which is a basically a tube of gas that they use a arc of lightning to excite to temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. Because you actually, when you re-enter, you're experiencing temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. And so, you know, they used to always say, well, if, you know, you go to Johnson, if you actually want to get to space, if you want to come home, you, come, you talk to Ames. Because we did all of the re-entry work. We also developed the blunt body concept here with our wind tunnels. Uh, so this is another spacecraft. I like pointing this out. Does anybody know the Mercury missions? The Mercury missions carried the first Americans into space. The first American, Alan Shepard, flew on a Mercury spacecraft. This actual, not this one, not this one, but this is actually, this was the backup. So this one never flew, but this one was built to fly. And so Alan Shepard flew in one that is exactly like this one. The original, the one that he actually flew in is at the Smithsonian. Um, but this is, this is theirs too, but they lent it to us. Thanks, Smithsonian. Um, and so imagine sitting inside of this thing and going into space. I, I, you know, honestly, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. And apparently the one that Alan Shepard actually flew in had no window. So you're kind of inside of this enclosed thing with all of this stuff happening outside of you and you can't even see anything? I don't think so. Not to mention that Alan Shepard was not a very big person. Because a very big person would not fit inside of that thing. Um, and in fact, you know, one of my favorite, I like that it's here, because then we can come across, and this is a Mercury spacesuit. So Alan Shepard flew in something like that capsule wearing this suit, wearing a suit like this one. 
And then next to it, we actually have a Gemini spacesuit, which is the series of missions that flew before Apollo. So when Mercury, Gemini, Apollo shuttle with the series of missions, plus all the rovers and all of those things that NASA flew. And over here, since I, since I think I have to, I'm worried about time here. Oh, I'm running out of time. So I, I want to take you to one of the other most exciting things that we have. The moon rock. So this is an actual piece of the moon. had to travel over 560,000 miles to get here. It is about 280,000 miles to the moon, and so there and back, 560,000 miles. This, this little hunk of rock, and the thing is, is that this rock, its estimated value is about $1.7 million. That's it. That's it. <laughs> can we borrow it? <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, um, we do have moon rocks that can be borrowed, but you basically have to sign your life away, and you also have to justify what you're borrowing it for. You can't like bring it home and. There are some people. Hey, check this out. Would like to see this. Um, we do. We do have. We have lent them out before. We have moon rocks that we have lent out, um, but this one here, it's you know, it's yeah, it's cool, huh? You know, and the thing is, is that this 1.7 million dollar rock is chemically is the exact same composition as this worthless piece of rock that I have sitting right here that you can really? actually touch. Yes. Wow. So I this is a piece of basalt. Time. That is a piece of basalt. Same thing, same composition. The difference is, is that on the moon, actually here is a real panorama of the moon. This is an actual image. In fact, this image is in color. This image is in color here on the wall. And the reason, you know, you can tell only by these couple little things like the American flag or... This car or those two UFOs up there? Just teasing. <laughs> hey, a lens for Teasing, that. teasing, teasing. And this is actually in the daytime. So, and the reason why we can tell it's in the daytime, of course, because it's bright and also he has, a, he has a shadow. Yeah. He has a shadow. And so, if this is in the daytime, tell me, why is the sky black? Yes, you are looking at space, There's but how come it's not black in the in the daytime at um uh, here on Earth? <laughs> Why? Tell me. Uh, because there isn't as much of an atmosphere to cause the white light coming from the sun to is the word diffract? Diffract. Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. There is not enough atmosphere for the light to diffract, and so in the daytime on the moon, you can see the stars. You can see the stars on the moon in the daytime, and um. The thing is, because there's so little atmosphere, there are no atmosphere, atmospheric processes like wind. There's no wind on the moon. And so, because there's no wind and no water, well, no flowing water, <laughs> you get, when you have a rock and it sort of disintegrates, or, you know, if you get a rock, it gets hit by something, it breaks up, you have no process to smooth those broken pieces. And so, all of the rock is incredibly sharp. And so if you breathe in moon dust, yeah, it's not good, not good, not good. And actually all of these, I have all of these different types of rock samples here. I have a piece of obsidian, and a piece of granite, and a piece of pumice, and another piece of basalt. And the reason why I have these, these were all made in, you know, with um, molten rock. And it's incredible how different they are. This is like, you know how when you shake up a Coke bottle and you open the cap and all this froth comes out? That's what this is. It's pumice. So, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of pumice stones to grind off your calluses. It's the same. That's what it is. It's the froth that comes out of a volcano. Then you have the glassy obsidian, which um, surgeons actually use. Because it is so fine, you can get it down to such a fine point, surgeons use it in, scalp in scalpels. Um, then you have granite. Well, this basalt is actually the more slow-moving lava that cooled very slowly. And then the granite actually is, is magma that pushes in between rocks and then cools over centuries. So that's what granite is. And um, it's all the same kind of stuff, chemically. But it looks very different. I think what we should do, if that's okay with you guys, I think we should watch the...
um, computer graphic, the computer generated image uh, film of the Curiosity landing. So Curiosity, the Mars Science Laboratory, was launched the day after Thanksgiving this year, and will land in August. And I want you to come back and watch the landing because they came up with a pretty fascinating system. As you can see, that's a fairly big spacecraft. This, this spacecraft that was launched weighed about 4,000 pounds, but it loses weight as it goes towards Mars. And it, the last thing to land, and notice off to the right there, that's the rover. That weighs about 2,000 pounds. So now we're going to talk about the launch. As you watch this launch video, you're going to hear several references, and I'm going to tell you what they are. You're going to hear references to the SR, S solid rocket boosters, SRBs. There are four of them on this rocket. The other thing that you'll hear talked about is something called Max-Q. Max-Q refers to the maximum dynamic pressure on this vehicle as it goes through the atmosphere and out into space. And finally, you'll hear a discussion of something called the spacecraft fairing. There is a protective covering over this spacecraft, and that covering is called a fairing, and you will see that jettison just before this thing goes into space. What happens there is that you get rid of the, the fairing, you get rid of a lot of weight and that helps the rocket go faster into space. So here's what the launch looks like. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Main engine start, zero, and lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Seeking clues to the planetary puzzle about life on Mars. Okay. 
SR, SRB Jet is SRB Jettison. And there they go. And the SRB uh, is the vehicle and the radiable tires. Everything is looking good. This is Rob Gannett, our United Launch Alliance Swim Team Manager. The vehicle is now 32 nautical miles in altitude, 54 miles downrange, traveling at 4,900 miles per hour. And we throttle down. Don't hold a constant 2.5 G level for the repair and jettison. So here you're looking up yeah, at the top of the, the rock. Let's pause. Pressure increasing a little bit as expected. Now we're hitting right over 2.5 G. We're not coming up on payload there. That is the process. Thank you. Thank you. And when that light goes out, it goes. There it is. Darn jet. And we also have a successful vehicle on Jettison. But as expected, throttling up on the RD-180, everything. Coming up to 89% thrust. Five seconds. Spacecraft set. Achieved our targeted roll rate. We have space separation. Plans confirmation from our video system. And the vehicle is in front. And with the successful separation of the MSL spacecraft from AB-28, let's conclude the commentary for this issue. And we have lots of uh, handshakes and smiling faces here in the control room because Bar Science Laboratory is on its way to Mars. So this launch took place on November 26th of 2011. The spacecraft itself is about halfway to Mars right now and will arrive at Mars on August 5th of this year. Now we're going to have a discussion of this landing site. I'm John Grotzinger, the project scientist for Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity rover, and we're going to take Curiosity to our chosen landing site in Gale Crater, which sits at the border between the southern highlands of Mars and the northern lowlands. A really exciting spot because it's very low, and that's the kind of place where water might have pooled and possibly formed lakes. So here we see a different view of Gale Crater that has a different perspective. You can see our landing ellipse down at the bottom there, which is the white circle. And in the middle of Gale Crater is this mountain of rock that is five kilometers high, made layer by layer by layer. But the layers at the bottom are the ones that we're most interested in because we think that those were deposited in an aqueous environment, which is very important for understanding habitability. What you can see here now is that we're about to land very close to the center of the landing ellipse. And we have a couple of different routes that we can take. The scientists on the team prefer the one on the right, and so what we would do is drive along it. And now you can see at the base of this mountain where these lower layers are. And the layers are important because they allow us to sort of read a geological book. You start at the bottom of the mountain, and those are the oldest layers, and then the layers that occur up there at the top, those are the youngest parts, the youngest chapters in the book. We will drive along up to this outcrop that we call the fence. And when we get there, we're going to study it. It's a really attractive spot for us because it contains the kind of minerals that form the water. And then when we're done with that, we're going to go beyond and we're going to enter a canyon. And this kind of terrain around here reminds us a lot of Sedona, Arizona. And all the rocks around here are formed in aqueous environments. And so there's a lot of rock, hundreds of meters of it. 
layer after layer that we can study to tell us about the history of Mars at Gale Crater. Now we cross a boundary and we go into a very different type of rock. You can see how it weathers very differently. It's really rugged. So at that point in the mission, we'll be beyond our initial mission of two Earth years. This will take us into many years afterwards of exploration as we drive around this very rugged terrain. If we make it, we'll be able to look back over the area that we have previously studied, back down in towards the bottom of Gale Crater, back towards our landing lips. Let us discuss the landing sequence. This is a very tricky maneuver, so pay attention to that. Watch how this thing lands on Mars. And then we'll talk about the surface operation once it gets down to the ground. For Curiosity can explore Mars. It's got to get there first. The last stage of the launch vehicle is the spacecraft to finally push and spins it up for our eight and a half month cruise to the red planet. Ten minutes before hitting the atmosphere, the cruise stage separates and final preparations for entry begin. Atmosphere at about 13,000 miles per hour, the spacecraft begins to slow down. While slowing down, the spacecraft uses thrusters to help steer toward the landing target. We throw off weights to rebalance the spacecraft so that it's lined up for parachute deploy. After slowing to about Mach 2, or about 1,000 miles per hour, we deploy the parachute to slow down even further. Once we're below the speed of sound, the heat shield separates and the spacecraft looks for the ground with a landing radar. Once we reach an altitude of about one mile, the spacecraft drops out of the back shell at about 200 miles an hour. It then fires up the landing engines to slow it down even further. Once we descend to about 60 feet above the ground and are going only about two miles per hour, the rubber separates from the descent stage. As the rover is lowered, the wheels deploy in preparation for landing. Once the rover is on the ground and touchdown has been detected, the descent stage cuts the rover loose. It flies away, leaving Curiosity safe on the surface of Mars. One of the first things Curiosity does after landing is to deploy the mast, which supports many cameras and instruments. Curiosity shoots a laser at an interesting target. This helps us quickly understand the kind and composition of that target from a distance of up to 30 feet. If the target's worth a closer look, Curiosity can drive up and inspect it with the instruments and tools at the end of its arm. The drill on the arm allows us to grab some of that rock and deliver it to the laboratory instruments inside the body of the rover. Those instruments can tell us even more about the mineral composition, getting us closer to understanding whether life could have existed on Mars.
Curiosity will be exploring the red planet for at least two Earth years, and there's no telling what we will discover. There's a couple of other things I can tell you about this. I mean, just to give you an idea of how big this machine is, this has been described as about the size of a Mini Cooper. It's about nine feet long, seven feet wide, and seven feet tall. It's five times heavier than the Mars Exploration Rovers. Those were the rovers that landed on Mars in 2004. This thing also does not have solar panels, you'll notice there. The way this thing, the power for this thing comes from something called a radioisotope thermal electric generator. Radioisotope means radioactive material. It's plutonium dioxide. It's 10 pounds of it on this thing and it can supply power to this machine for a minimum of 14 years and a maximum of 40 years. So this could last as long as it takes to get humans to Mars. And lastly, I'll tell you, this thing is going to land on August 5th, which is a Sunday. If you go to the Mars Science Laboratory website, you will find a clock. And that's a countdown clock to when this thing will land. And it's now, if you do the math, it comes out to be about 10 o'clock in the evening on August 5th. This place will be open for that. So if you live close by, this is going to be an exciting time. This is probably the biggest thing that's going to happen at NASA this year. Let's just hope it's successful because this cost you two and a half billion dollars. Any questions about this? That landing technique right there, by the way, is I went to a lecture over at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. There was a guy talking about this, and he said that landing technique is what has the scientists and engineers most nervous. That's really a, it's a little precarious the way they're going to do that. One thing you have to appreciate about this is the precision that goes into doing this. This thing was launched on November 26th. Mars is rotating on its axis. It's moving through space. Earth is moving through space. And this is designed to land on a particular spot on Mars. So it's, it's a heck of a feat of finesse to get this down to the surface. All right, well, thank you for coming this afternoon. Enjoy your visit. So, and thank you, Yelpers, for coming out and, uh, and getting this little peek at what we do. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out. And the Visitor Center does have a Yelp page, so if you had fun today, please let us know. I would appreciate it. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think that's going to conclude our tour for today, um, unless you guys have any questions. And I also, I'm, I'll be right up there at the front um, with my business cards if you guys want my business card. So thank you.